It is my pleasure to introduce the closing keynote speaker, Adam Bello. Everything is cool when you're part of the team. Thank you. Everything is awesome. Yeah. All right. Wow, you know, so no pressure, but Mike just told me, he's like, no, no pressure. But just to remind you, Steve Jobs was our second keynote speech giver. Thank you for that. Thank you. Good. Okay, so hi, I'm really, really stoked to be here. Um, it is for many reasons. One is because this was a picture from my house last week. Um, <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, it's a little bit nicer here. Uh, but don't tell my wife and family that because they called me and actually my wife texted me a little while ago and she said to me, she's like, hi, uh, how is it? She actually said, hi, hon, hope you had a great trip. How's the weather? Uh, we got about six inches of snow, ugh. And I wrote to her and I said, conference is awesome so far, incredible speakers, blah, 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 which it was. And as for the weather, snowing here too. And I used, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so there, it, it has been, it has been an incredibly awesome conference. I want to thank you so much for having me out here. Um, I, I got to go to a lot of sessions. Uh, hopefully some of your sessions are sat near you or at a session and learned a lot. And I really appreciate that because it's important to, you know, as much as you like to share things, it's as much to learn things, which obviously that's why you're sitting here. So you should know a little bit about who stands before you. That's me. Um, thank you, Bert, for the, as I asked, a short introduction because, you know, Sometimes people are like, you know, your life story. Well, he was born at 6.42 a.m. And uh, so me in 30 seconds, this is me as a kid. I know, right? What happened is what I want to know all the time. I'm like, <laughs> geez. So I, I grew up as a kid and my one true wish, my, my, you know, I wanted to be Superman. That didn't work out. But I wanted to be a teacher. My parents were both teachers. And I just wanted to grow up and do something that mattered. Um, so like you, I taught for the money, right? We all teach for money, you know? Well, some people do. I mean, come on, right? <laughs> so, so um, or summer vacation? Who teaches summer vacation? No. So you teach because you want to change the world, right? And, and I've talked about that before, so I'm not going to do that again. But it's important to know that, that as much as, as sometimes it's a hard thing to do, and it, oftentimes it's a hard thing to do, it's a great, great task. It's a great challenge to inspire our kids to be the future. So I'll skip this stuff. My, my you know, some people are like, well, where would you do? So I taught high school English, I was an assistant technology director, I was a technology director, I was, started a couple of startups, lots of stuff. Like all of you, I wore lots of hats and uh, the journey is still going, right? This is not a one-way conversation. I know it's hard because you're sitting in this medium. Um, please feel free to get on the Twitters and start talking amongst yourselves and I will jump in and join as soon as this is done. I always like to jump back and you know, kind of continue conversations or answer questions or whatever it is. Uh, and if you don't know Twitter, here you go. Check it out. I'm sending a tweet. Tweet. That's not how it works, Grandpa. Ah, uh, uh, a reply. I'm trendy. Yeah. <laughs> so keep calm and tweet on. Um, as you know, the hashtag is Q15. Hopefully you know that. If you didn't, surprise, it's like the last session, but that's still the hashtag. Uh, my name on Twitter is Adam Bello. You can at reply me and I'll talk back to you. So I apologize in advance. I will say that I'm a very proud dad. Uh, while I have cute props, I'm going to use them. <laughs> um, so they're cute. What can I say? I don't know. When they, when they hit 13, it might be like a different slideshow. I'll use like those stock photos of like Vince Vaughn. Um, <laughs> So, so there's Hunter and Reed, six and four. Reed was like, Daddy, make sure you tell them I'm four now. I'm like, I'll let them know. It's all good. So um, with that out of the way, let's get started for real. I call the presentation Crossroads because I think that's kind of where we are in education right now. We're at a very critical point. And I, and I feel like there's, there's so much amazingness that we're doing and so much more that we have yet to do. So we stand very much at this educational crossroads. And I want to talk about the past. I want to talk a little bit about the future, and I want to, of course, bookend that with a little bit about the present, right? Something that we're going through right now. So those are our three time sets. And context really is everything. So I'll tell you, when we talk about the future, future could be a very amorphous term, right? Like right now is the future, five minutes from now is the future, tomorrow morning is the future, whatever. But um, I, I want to give it some context. And I give you a disclaimer as well. You know, you need to know that I have not yet been to the future. I am not, as they say, a futurist, you know, of sorts. Um, so I'm traveling kind of at the same pace you guys are. 
this is when I was born. I know people are like, I have shoes older than you. So, um, but, but if you think about technology, I've seen the onset of the five and a quarter inch disc, which was amazing, double-sided, come on. And go all the way now to everything being in the cloud. And I always wonder, I'm like, we live in a crazy time. I wonder what's gonna happen at the end. So we have these time periods. I'm gonna take everything that happened before right now and say it's the past, okay? So I'm gonna look at these buckets of time and we'll have the past, now, 2029, I'll explain why I chose that in a bit, and then, you know, we can talk about the theoretical future all we want, but we're never gonna make it, sorry guys. <laughs> um, we'll be dead, isn't that uplifting? So, <laughs> yeah, so we'll start with the past, uh, and we, we'll start with that, that quick trip back in time, really easy, as we all go down that road to memory lane, right? And here it is, a long time ago in a classroom far, far away. This was our technology journey, right? So we had our, right? And it kept on going, right? We, we kept on evolving slowly, the carts that almost killed children. This is the most unsafe piece of technology in the entire school. Uh, and yet every kid wanted to be the one to bring it down the hall. It was like a death trap. Anyway, so calculators, whiteboards, carts of computers that barely worked, carts of laptops that hopefully work most of the time sometimes, clickers that, you know, whatever, uh, tablets of any sort. But to go back and give you real context, that was me. <laughs> yes, I know. Yes. Oh, thank you. Wow. Okay. Eyesight check for the first row. Um, and I grew up with, with titles like this, right? This was my computer lab where we learned Oregon Trail and we did, uh, you know, Math Blaster. And of course, we've all died of dysentery, I would hope. Yeah. Printed out banners for birthdays. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, everyone always claps when I show this. I have to give you a caveat. First of all, when this came out, I was four, and I did not make the software. I just showed you a picture. Sometimes I think, I'm like, the keynote would go really well if I just showed like nostalgic stuff for like an hour and a half. And they'd be like, thank you, everyone. I'll see you later. Um, but I watched this on TV, and yet in school, I was doing this, right? How many people learned Logo Turtle, right? Where you were learn how to make a box, you know? And then it went and fell dormant for about 30 years, and now we have, oh my God, we're gonna teach kids how to code. It's like, oh wait, well, you know, that was something we did a while ago. This was what educational technology was. It was a passive experience where kids touched technology and did what you know, the inventors of the tools wanted them to do. There was no creativity in it involved, except for, enjoy that sound, by the way, right? Yeah, I tried to tell my kids, I'm like, we had to wait and pull off the paper on the sides. And you know that, the, yeah, right? This was the nerdiest thing I owned as a kid. On April 24th, we'll all own one of these, I guess, maybe, or for the haters out there, they might have the Moto 360, it's all good, we're, it's a peaceful environment here. Um, so times really have changed. This was my first camera, does anyone remember this? Yeah, so, so I remember this for a couple of reasons. One is that you, know, you had 12 exposures, and you know, when you took five pictures at an event that you wanted to you know, get developed, which took a week and a half to get developed, but when you took those pictures, you're like, oh well, I can't just bring in this, I have to take like, pictures of my feet so I can get through the roll real fast. And God forbid you want to take a picture in the dark, you had to stick a light bulb in the top of this thing. Like this is how you took a flash photo, right? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Um, so we now have come to like where we are now, and, and it's pretty amazing. We, we live in an incredible time. This is the present, obviously, in case you didn't know. Uh, and, and I do want to remind you, don't take it for granted. We live and we teach in an incredibly amazing time. We're jaded by so much stuff. I mean, I'm the same way, like gadgets, you know, you get the new version of whatever, you get new software, you get everything. But, you know, the same way I tell my kids, like we had to pull the paper off the sides, it's like when you walk through the exhibit hall or you walk through like what's going on in schools, more importantly, and you see kids making things on a 3D printer, my head explodes and I smile because the reality is, is that's crazy. And all the other stuff that comes in between is just amazing. So just keep that in mind. We live in the day of Instagram, as you all know. How many people on Instagram? Okay, good, it's hot. I won't make you raise your hands that many times, I promise. So, Instagram, right? If it, it did not happen <laughs> if it was not on Instagram. And I know everyone's really excited about Meerkat. It didn't happen if I didn't see it watching on Meerkat. No, okay, fine. So, we document everything, and people say, oh, well, let's take a selfie. I know Jenny had to take a selfie before. I saw lots of people take selfies over the week, and I did a few myself, you know, whatever, it's all good. Um, selfies is not about um, being nostalgic and, and, and being narcissistic, I mean. This guy, when he went to the moon, he took five photos. Jessica went to the bathroom, took 37 photos, right? <laughs> but, and that's what people associate, right? Like, oh, it's people narcissistic. Well, Robert Cornelius took a selfie too. He did so in 1839. This is the world's first selfie, right? It's not a new concept. 
And I think we could use it in a really positive way. I think selfies is a wonderful way to harness our students and what they are doing in class. Could you imagine having kids not only take, sel take selfies with their projects at various stages to put in a digital portfolio along with what they were doing? How cool would that be? These kids are using it all the time now, and I think it's really actually a very powerful tool. Instagram, I love Instagram because the people I follow are inspiring. So Lisa Heifel is using Insta- <laughs> Woo! I know, she's not even here, so sad, but Lisa's using it, and I love her feed because every day I am seeing awesome, awesome stuff that her kids are doing. Uh, Franz Davis is, is documenting- Ref Yeah, you can clap for Franz. She's not here either, it's all good. Um, She's using it to, to capture Braden's art, which is just an amazing, you know, you, you want to watch an amazing, passionate young child just explore and get more and more uh, talented as, as time goes on. It, follow her, for sure. Uh, and she's a genius on a lot of other areas, but, you know, this, just for me, I just find this so touching because it really, it, it ex exacerbates this passion that this young guy has. Um, you can use it in your classroom. Everyone's like, well, Instagram, I don't know. Well, I use If This Then That, which is like one of my favorite nerdy tools. And I, you can use it to make a recipe that says if you tag something with, uh, in Instagram with the hashtag Q15, for an example, then you can add it to a weekly digest to be sent to you at four o'clock on a Friday, let's say, and then you forward it to all your parents. Really cool ways to like, you know, use this stuff in your room. But I will tell you it is our present. And I talk about our as in like the people that are sitting in front of us, right? Because you know those people where they're like, at a faculty room last week, someone's got like, I got this great new app called Edmodo. And you just want to be like, oh my God. We, you know, like, we've been using it for uh, five years. We are from their future. So in some ways, I guess we've been there, right? It's true, it's true. As an early adopter, you have to know that what you discuss over here and what you're passionate about will be what they come to find as reality in five years from now. <laughs> What I would challenge you to do is spoil the ending for them. Get them to come with you a little faster, right? As I said before, coding is not new. This is a book I took out of the library when I was a kid. This is one I have for my kids. So things really haven't changed all that terribly much. We have the technology. We definitely, yeah. For those of you who laugh, that's the old folks. Um, it's good. It helps me separate the audience. Sorry, just saying, just saying. Um, so, it, it, we have the technology today, and the frustrating part about that, to me, the most frustrating piece is that despite having this technology, despite having kids with low-cost machines and devices and so many creative tools, we judge everyone in this way. And we've marched towards a way of just saying everyone lockstep on the same boring path. So, I'll talk about that. When I was a kid, I was, the, I was that kid. Why do I have to learn this? As an adult, I say, why do we have to learn it in this way? How is this learning? How do we assess it? And, you know, I'll talk about some buzzwords. Be careful. It's a tech conference. We have to have the buzzwords. I guarantee you went to a session that had some of these words, right? And that's not a bad thing. These are not bad things. I think that sometimes when you say things to people that don't understand them, they get misconstrued into something else. Like, I'm flipping my classroom. Mm, what do you do? You know, like, I'm not going to get into it, right? Right? You've had Sal Khan, you've had Ramsey, you've had people really know what's going on in that. I'm just, I'm just gonna say, like, sometimes people think buzzwords, and like, oh yeah, I don't use buzzwords a lot. When I do, I use them thoughtfully, <laughs> right? Or at least I try. So with that said, I love this word, innovation. We're in California, I've heard a lot of people talking about innovation, 20 time, all this stuff. A reminder that innovation is not the same thing as iteration. It is, it is dreadfully important that we must remember that it is not the same thing to be just iterative and say that we're changing the game. For example, if you come out with an app that can take a picture of a Scantron and give you feedback, you're not necessarily reinventing it, right? This is a, a Pearson catalog. Pearson is selling all their textbook products, right? Um, and in the bottom right, you, you notice it takes up a lot of the screen. There's this picture of an iPad, and it says, ready for iPad ready teacher edition. That's not Photoshop, so that's a PDF. So it's ready for the iPad as a static image, but what are you gonna do with it, right? I worked for the College Board for a brief period of time, and I worked uh, with the AP group, and I also worked with the College Readiness group. And we had a meeting once, and we talked about doing innovative things. And it said, the College Readiness Advanced Placement Innovation Update. And I looked down at the deck and I said, does anyone realize it says crap update? Crap innovation update? <laughs> right? Truer words were never spoken, trust me. <laughs> anyway, 
What, what innovation is, when you want to know when you're being innovative, it's when you sit in the precipice, the, the, the intersection of fear and bravery, when you're bold enough to try something that you, mo- you know might not work, and you know that when you take risks, you might fall, right? This is something, this is not new to us. This is risk-taking. This is the, the second bulletproof vest <laughs> being tested. But this audience knows a lot about risk-taking because this was you the other day, right? That's risk-taking, yeah. Yeah. And last night, there was a lot of risk-takers, too. I even took a risk myself. Thank God there is no video for that. (laughs) Um, But we talk about the F-words, and the F-words, you know, I've talked about the F-word before, and there are actually two. It's it's fear, but it's specifically the fear of failure. It's the fear of failure, and and that is something that teachers and adults, talk about that as a parent, can easily pass on. Way too easily, I think. Failure is not a permanent condition, and yet we sometimes pretend that, oh my God, if we fail, it's done. Like there are some things, you know, you touch the lights, you know, socket with a fork, that's not so good, but other things are okay. And since failure is not permanent, it's the fear of failure that is the greatest barrier to our success and to our kids' success. If you fail, own it. When Jenny asked us to dance the other day, I was like, well, I'm going to fail miserably here. And hopefully it'll be on Ellen, which is awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the, the, the flip side of that is if you take risks and you accept failure on yourself and your kids, you have to forgive people if they make a mistake. So that's just the, that's just the way it is. A lot of times as an adult, and I say this again as a father, I, I tell you, 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 stop, stop, let me help you, let me do it. But instead of doing that, we have to push them further, say, oh, you know what, five more minutes, you get to explain, you know, explore it, and then if you still need help, we'll look at it. Put your hands behind your back when you go around the room. Sometimes as a teacher, I was be like, oh, you know what, let me, let me help you. It's our need to want to help, but sometimes we have to help a little less. And I think that's important. This is a picture of me making my first student film. I went to film school. That turned out great, right? I'm a f- filmmaker here in LA, and uh, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I went to film school, and um, I, what I, I credit is my teachers, and, my, and specifically my parents, for saying, you know what? Follow that dream, follow that passion. We're not gonna stop you. And this was me, uh, one of my favorite pictures. I'm looking at this 16 millimeter film, and they didn't have a video of this. What's going through my head is, I think I broke this camera, I don't know what to do. (laughs) It's a Bolex camera, anyway. So, (laughs) I became a teacher shortly thereafter, because my film career kind of didn't go anywhere, which is totally cool. Um, But I became a teacher and I started working at a school called the Churchill School, which was a school for kids with language-based learning disabilities. And um, I was told that I had a class that was really, really low level. So give them something low, right? I didn't know that that was what I was supposed to do, so I was like, okay, well, the the guy I was working with, we did Don Quixote. We read Don Quixote, and as a final assessment, we made this film. And in fact, when I say we, there was a student, one guy in particular, who made this film. It's an amazing film. This was made 14 years ago. He did it on Final Cut. The child had such a hard time reading, but was such, he had such depth of knowledge of how cinema worked and how to operate cameras and set up shots and do editing and effects. And it was just, this is an incredible, incredible, incredible project. It was truly breathtaking. We screened it for the school. There was no YouTube at the time, which is crazy to think there was no YouTube. But anyway, this was the, this was the film that we made. So I'm watching YouTube going down the rabbit hole the other day, and I come across a movie trailer. I love to watch movie trailers. I don't know if anyone's in that boat, but I do. And I saw this, and I'm not gonna show you the whole thing. Seems very intense, right? So this is a movie coming out called Retina. And that's my student. <laughs> and that, yeah. No, 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 but, so, so let, me, let, me, let me bring it back. So there's no, cl- clap for him, yes, that's great. But, but here's what I wanna say. I had absolutely nothing to do with this, nothing at all. With the exception of saying, when he said, I wanna help make the movie and do the movie, that we said, yeah, that sounds awesome. It's, you know, I take no credit for the success, but that's incredible. That's incredible because it takes very little to destroy someone's dream. And that goes for our students as it goes for ourselves. Sometimes we have a fear of results. What could happen? You know, I think it's the other way. It's like, what, what could happen? Like, <laughs> it's just the inflection that's gonna change that. You'll never scratch your new car if you don't drive it, ever. And we all know this, right? The first time you scratch a car, you're like, oh my God. And then the next time it's like, okay, the door fell off. It's good, I have four more, I have three more, it's good. <laughs> But you know what I love? It's that fear of starting something. We've all had this, right? Uh, a new movie, or relatively new movie, Big Hero 6, uh, yeah, which is awesome. Yeah, there's a, a great clip that I, I could think I could show you like 10 seconds before Disney comes after me, so here you go.
right? <laughs> Have we all been there? Sometimes it happens here. Trust me, I know. Sometimes it happens when you buy those nice moleskin journals. And you're like, I don't know what I would have to contribute to this journal. It's so beautiful. And you open it up, you're like, well, we'll just leave that on the shelf. Right? <laughs> happens here. Happens here for me. I don't know about you, but <laughs> this is like major pain sometimes. Um, give yourself a permission slip. Tell yourself it's okay to take a risk. Because what's the worst that can happen? Seriously. It allows you to live a life that is in beta. It allows you to live a life where you say, I'm going to be as good as I can be today, and I promise to be better tomorrow. If you respect your failure, it helps you to embrace curiosity. And curiosity really is what allows our ideas to grow. And I like to talk about ideas in terms of the cycle of ideation, where you have this dream or a concept or an idea or a thought, and you're able to take that dream or idea and go after it and build something, do something, make something, do something with your kids, or just give them the start, and then they share it or you share it. We know we have a million places to share everything these days, which is awesome. And you get feedback. And value, when I say value, I don't mean obviously monetary value. I mean the ability to unlock something to help you go further, to help your kids go further. That is what the cycle is. And then you start, of course, coming up with your next idea and doing it again. I love the idea of being able to break it, make it, and then share it. And sometimes people say, well, the you can debate the order all you want. The reality is if you're sharing what you do, and you're really cycling that, that idea, you're going to be better at it, for sure. We've seen this probably, <laughs> right? Learning, what some people think it looks like. I've seen this with success. I just think learning fits right, <laughs> right as well in there. Sometimes it's a mess, and that's okay. It's a big change for a lot of schools. We are here with the creme de la creme, the like-minded folks who all drink the Kool-Aid and sing Kumbaya about technology and education. You know next to you, you wish you could have dragged 50 people from your building, your district, your whatever. It's a big change. It's a big change. My biggest fear is that my own children, along with thousands upon millions of other children, are going to be sitting in their schools saying, only 11 more years. <laughs> right? It's sad. No kids running off the bus with a scantron saying, look what I did, look what I did, it's amazing. <laughs> we don't hang them up at back to school night, we hang up work. We respect our kids for their work because value is not an A+. Plus. <laughs> value is not a, a scantron bubbled in. Value is kids learning by doing, by making, by then learning something else. This is the student showcase from this afternoon. I hope that you all got to see what was going on because honestly, I have never been so impressed by the student projects at a, at a conference. And this is 100% true. Not, uh, yeah, you can clap for everyone there. What I love about this is twofold. And I'll give you credit because I think it's your conference where all the awesome kids are hanging out. Sometimes you see one or two good projects. I saw every single project there. I was impressed by every single one of them. And they were doing things from playing with Spheros and playing with robotics and playing with Legos. And this girl, I don't know if she's here, but was drawing the most amazing picture. And I actually said to her, I'm like, Are you, you have a template? You have anything on? And she was doing it on like a bamboo tablet. Amazing. You don't tell these kids no. You tell them go. The idea, you know, being able to give a kid the idea and say, look, if you have wonder and curiosity about something, go, because that's going to turn into interest and that's going to turn into passion, and then you'll get that grit and that growth. As I said, this is a book I used to read from the library and type in commands and make my own games on my Commodore, right? I didn't learn because these two guys, as wealthy as they are, told me it was a great idea. There wasn't some fancy video on YouTube that everyone watched saying, like, everyone should code. No, I learned to code because it gave me the keys to unlock something I was passionately interested about. We need to give our kids these opportunities. You give yourself a, a goal because it unlocks a piece of what you want to know. It's not about giving a kid a carrot and a stick and saying, oh, hey, okay. hey everyone has to do this because it's exciting or you'll get a zero. You say, you know what? What do you love to do? And then you could wrap everything around that. Scratch Junior. I love the fact that my kids are playing on Scratch Junior. This is my son, Reed, who's now four. Remember, four, four. We should all sing happy birthday later. But anyway, so um, see, we were playing with Pixel Press, where you can make your own video games. I dreamed of this as a child. I used to draw my own Mario games out on my dining room table. It was ridiculous. Now you can do that, take a picture of it with the iPad, and then play the level. And this teaches you not just about game design. This teaches you about all sorts of amazing things, like, oh, physics. If he's jumping at this rate for that long, he'll jump into the fire, because I didn't have enough of a landing. It, it's very cool. Uh, and then you share those games and you edit them. I'd like to say it's not an hour of code, it's hours of code. 
It's hours of everything. The goal is not to get kids to do something for a minute, you know? It's not like a sample. You want to get them hooked on something exciting. This is a great quote. I don't do a lot of text on the slide, but I really like this quote, and I don't want to mess it up. So I'm going to say it's from The Little Prince. And it's, if you want to build a ship, you don't drum up people to collect wood. You don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. That's what I want for my kids. That's what I want for our kids. And this goes for learning anything. And I'm about to show you the best movie you will see all year. Here it is. It's called The Reader. Evening. Evening. May I ring that up for you? Yes, please. Have a good evening. Hey, Tubbs, mm. I read your book. You read my book? Mm hmm Barman, give that man a bell. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a Scotch commercial. <laughs> All right, so who's going to admit that they're crying right now, right? So I say that, I, I've shown this a bunch now. I found it last year, and it's honestly like, I, I always look at the videos, and I'm like, I, I want to show new videos. That is the best, I think I'm gonna show that video until I'm like 100 years old. I mean, that is like the best, best video for so many reasons, and it hits here because it hits us as a learner, it hits us as a teacher, and, and it hits us as, as someone who understands how important it is to give those kids the drive to learn something for their own good as opposed to because we tell them. It's not about finding the questions answer that we all know in the back of the book or highlighted. It's about giving them the quest to come up with better questions that they can go after with passion and vigor. As a teacher, my, my least favorite activity was to do lesson plans. And I had to do them every day, yeah. And at the top, the header was SWOBOT. Did you guys have SWOBOT? Students will be able to. What they need to be able to do is to be able to question, to be able to think, and then to be able to act. That's what they need to be able to do. If I was going back in the classroom right now, I would put this on all the lesson plans, hand it in, and probably get fired, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's all good. We have to change the way we talk about school. You know, I, I, a buzzword for the last three years has been college and career ready, preparing kids for what is next. So here's college, here's career, and here's their ready. <laughs> We're not in the business of serving education, right? It's, it's not about having 99 billion served, everyone in the same educational path, because we're all a little bit different, I would hope. Common Core. What can we say about the Common Core? So Common Core is, is probably, you know, it's a dichotomous thing as well, because it's probably one of the best ideas and the worst implementations of an idea I've ever seen in my life. So it's a little bit like this, right? So. So it's as common as a Whopper. And, but the one, thing, the one thing I will tell you I do enjoy about the Common Core is when I used to see these things come along. My teacher said that Common Core is the reason she drinks before breakfast. <laughs> Dear Santa, please bring us Common Core. I really like zombies and I want to be one when I grow up. But what kills me is when I hear my kids say something like this. Last year my son said to me, I don't want to go to school today, I want to stay home and learn. And that's really messed up on a whole bunch of levels. And he's not doing it as a ploy, he's doing it because that's what he really thinks. I don't know why, his curriculum is very colorful. 
it comes in a box that is easy to distribute. I don't think publishers will always be earning. I don't think this is going to be the way. Do you remember when you had to make your own curriculum because you were a teacher with some autonomy? Yeah, I think we're getting back there. I think it's going to happen. It won't always be like this. I don't think we could sell standardized happiness. I think that that's more important than standardized assessments. And my grandfather used to tell me, he used to say to me, when all else fails, read the instructions, read the directions. Have you ever read the directions on your kid's homework or on homework you give out perhaps? And we give directions for everything. First of all, it don't make sense. And second of all, sometimes we don't even need them. My son brought home a prize from his little fair at school the other day. And I swear to God, this is what it said. Instructions for fun, which you know is a dangerous heading. <laughs> to make fun kazoo sound, hum into larger end of the kazoo. Not everything needs directions, folks. This is a real sign that came home. I, maybe, I don't know. I was just like, I'm looking at this. I'm like, oh, really? Because I thought you stick it in your ear. And anyway, I don't know. You have homework assignments. I mean, I, I post these on anyone who wants to follow me on Twitter or Facebook, please feel free. I sometimes need help with my first graders homework. <laughs> Genuinely need help. Four master's degrees, I can't figure it out. I help him by getting through some of the mundane things. <laughs> yep, we, yeah. But the sad thing is, is my son loves to read. I, I'm, I'm one of those dads who will tell you all the good stuff about their kid. My son has a lot of stuff that he struggles with, for real. He has a lot of struggles. However, he's a really good reader. This is the book he gets home from school in the beginning of the year. And this is him reading the encyclopedia at home. <laughs> That's what it looks like. I can't even pronounce half the words in that thing. And I go to his school the other day and I see this sign hanging up in the hallway. It says, why read 20 minutes at home? I am, I, and people have argued this on Facebook with me and it's fine. You should read 20 minutes at home. You should read more than that at home. But the problem is, is I shouldn't see at the bottom that it says over here, scores in the 90th percentile on standardized tests. The goal is not to make you a better test taker to read. The goal is because you want to be able to be able to read, to explore, to be lost in a new world or find new things. I sent my kid to school as a lit match. And sadly, that's what's happening. This is a school in a neighboring district, pretty close to where I live. And uh, this is a note that was sent home to the parents last year as to why the kindergarten show was canceled. And it says, this is the, the salient part, the reason for eliminating the kindergarten show is simple. We are responsible for preparing our children for college and career with valuable lifelong skills. We are making these decisions with the interests of the children in mind. <laughs> Canceling the kindergarten show, because that, you know, five days of having fun is going to ruin it. Have, many of you have seen this go around, I would imagine, last year. This is basically a letter going out from a headmaster of a school uh, overseas who says, you know, the scores are out, that's great. It doesn't tell you how amazing your kid is at art or how they can solve problems in, their, in the playground or how they can be a good person. And I really respect that. So what am I doing? Well, when I get home, I'm picking up a packet from my school board that I'm running for. Because I'm talking. Thank you. You can't vote, it's fine. I just got tired of sitting on my hands, you know, crossing my fingers and hoping for the best. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll get the Twitter campaign and it'll be fun. So I just feel bad for, you know, like it's going to be fun all around. Um, what I want to see in schools again is freedom. What I want to see as a teacher is something that my, my, some of my best friends, in fact, probably 95% of my best friends are all teachers. And I hear, you know, like this, this, I used to be able to, I used to be, but now I can't, I can't. No, you need to have the autonomy. The best work shouldn't go on behind the closed door. The best work should go on out in the open. These are just movements. <laughs> These are movements. And like all movements, and like all movements, <laughs> right? I mean, trust me, at Q2026, we're not going to be sitting around saying, Oh, the Common Core State Standards have really gotten things really, trust me, trust me. Um, what saddens me though is not this. You know, people are like, oh, you know, it's such a waste of money. No, it, obviously it's a waste of billions of dollars. That's not a problem though. Well, the problem is it's a waste of kids. You know, we're losing kids and more importantly, or equally as important, we're losing teachers in droves. There are teachers, if they haven't left, I know one of some of my best friends, they've just checked out. The car is in cruise control. We got the tenure going. We're just going to make it through. Only 11 more years. And that's sad. No classes this week. State assessments will resume your child's real education in two weeks. <laughs> and yes, I know this is a sign generator, but the fact that you all laughed because it could be true is scary. <laughs> the road to edge of problems are all paved with good intentions. We know that technology in school could be a game changer, right? 
Game changer, right? No? <laughs> Solutions get cooked up in boardrooms that look like this. I've worked in them. <laughs> then product engineers come together to solve the world's problems in their common rooms at dorms. Our kids need more than just good intentions. <laughs> we need more than good intentions. They need us to be able to go and be autonomous and do the amazing things that we are doing and share it with other folks as well. And educational technology has to be more than digital replication. A lot of what I've seen is digital replication. The stuff that you guys are doing is so much deeper. You know that we shouldn't be using technology for technology's sake, and the reason being is simple. I remember when this was awesome. Now, not so much. The reason it's not awesome is because this is my oldest son, who literally could have been in a cocoon of LEDs and you know, touch screens and everything, and you know this. If you have young kids, you know that they're just, you know, digital natives, whatever you want to call them, they get it. And it's not impressive, and they expect it. He knew how to use the iPhone better than my wife. That's not a lie. Now she's pretty good, but, you know, at the time, he was winning. This is an interactive whiteboard. It costs $4.99 at Staples. Seriously. But we've done a really good job at taking poor quality education and democratizing it, and then providing metrics to teachers that are already too busy to even understand what these poor quality metrics do. Here's some data. Does anyone sit back and look at this stuff at the end of the day and be like, I see a lot of progress going on right here, that's great. Now I love big data, I think it's great. You know, big data is fine, yeah. Big data is fine, but when you have things like time on site and you think that that's important, that's digital seat time. Has anyone ever clicked on a browser and gone to the bathroom, made a snack, come back? You don't think your kid is literally watching, you know, the static scroll of the whatever they're doing for an hour and 45 minutes, do you? Tab the browser? I don't know. Anyway, success is really easy to measure. And you guys are seeing that success and being able to measure it much more accurately and much more cheaply than these tools. Because it means your kids come to school, they engage, they create, they share, and then they come back tomorrow, they do it again. That's what it is to be engaged, and I think all of our students deserve and need an IEP, an individualized education goal or plan, not a systematized one. We need it for all learners. All of our kids should have the ability to see what they're doing, be able to measure up to it, set a goal that's a little shorter. I don't need to wait until June to find out how I did for the last three, six, eight months. Set small goals. I like to do it in this way. It's not hard, by the way. It's just different for a lot of folks. FutureMe.org is a site where you can send an email to yourself in the future. Try it this week. Try it today after the conference is over. Send yourself an email with five things you wanted to try from the Q conference this year and be able to say, set the date for two weeks from now, a month from now, and say, oh, did you try these things? Remember, you wanted to do them. Use Boomerang for Gmail. Same thing, it'll come delivered to you at a later date. This is a great way to do self-assessments with kids. You could use it for behavior. You could use it for awesome projects. It's a really, really easy way to start with reflection. Because allow these questions, allow this reflective process to learn and grow, be part of it. That's when you start to get into the cool stuff, right? When you start to do project-based learning. Digital portfolios, every kid needs one. I worked on a tool that does that. You don't have to use it, use something. Use something, give them some place to put their awesome work and share it with someone else. Learning isn't clinical. This is not the end game for learning. This is more what I wanna see. And hardware, we come talk about hardware. So I love talking about the future and hardware because we talked about the past a little bit, and we looked at Moore's Law, and it still seems to be relatively in effect, although people think it's gonna peter out soon. With the abilities of what we can do is insane, and the cost is ridiculous. Now I know sometimes I look at the 3D printers and I'm like, oh, it's $4,000, but it's so cool. It'll be 50 bucks next year. And if you, think I'm, if you think I'm kidding, there are already $100 make-it-yourself kits of 3D printers you can buy. So it's, it's happening. If we have all this technology, we need to have better infrastructure. <laughs> it is a sin, an absolute sin, that I can go and get Wi-Fi in Starbucks, but I go into classrooms all over the country, and I can't get online. <laughs> thankfully, yeah, thankfully we are doing a lot of this good work to stop that. You know, I'm sure you've been following along. There's lots of good initiatives that are going on right now. I'd like to also point out, you know, Wi-Fi on planes, I still think is amazing. I'm sorry, it's just like awesome. Wi-Fi on buses. There's a school right in here in California that I read about last week. Is, are you guys here? Or you're just California, yes, place. 
Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the school is giving Wi-Fi in buses. This is not like novel. We used to do it like when we had kids go home, we used to send hotspots down with them. But installing Wi-Fi in bus points because they have an hour and a half ride, amazing. If Google could put Loon up in the sky and give access floating in hot air balloons, if you haven't seen this project, you should check this out online, Project Loon, where there's access to get all over the world, then we should damn well be able to get it in our class. That's the real digital divide. It's not does every kid have an iPad, it's the fact that does every kid have access to the essential skills, the essential things that they need. The digital divide is about educational justice. It's about justice and it's the fact that all children in all schools, no matter what their socioeconomic status, no matter what they are or what they look like, they all have access to the technology. And we're working on it. I mean, obviously, the government actually is moving forward as, as quick as they can, although it's like, you know, it's like treading through, <laughs> through quicksand. But they're getting very far. They're getting further. It's happening. That's when we're getting to, you know, of course, everyone's been doing BYOT, BYOD for a while now, right? But with that comes the idea that you date the device and you marry the ability. This is not something we're going to marry. What you buy today will not be your device you take to the grave, hopefully. Just, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> I, that's a, I don't mean to be a downer. I just want, you know, it's like a good wish. I don't, so device agnostic. You know how like when you pick up your phone now, you could log in with your thumbprint? Whether it's in the front of the phone or the back of the phone. I'm not playing favorites here, Apple. Uh, <laughs> But the idea is, I think that that's great. What I also think is great is I'm gonna be able to, the same way you go to a Chromebook and log in and all your stuff is there, I'm gonna be able to touch a mobile device and it becomes my desktop, my machine. That's happening, it's gonna be here real soon. We live in a world of wearables. I'm not wearing that Google Glass thing anymore, I'll talk about that in a minute, but all these devices, all these things are coming for you. This was me, where, yeah. That's how I got Google Glass and yes, I, I was, one of the first Google Glass endorsers, and it is awesome, and it is still a very cool idea. This is my son who thought it was like normal. He's like, oh yeah, cool, I got it. Our picture is good, we're good. These are some kids that tried it on during a summer trip I took. This is what I got back on the video when I, when I got the glasses back. Oh, no, it's supposed to say that. No, okay, it's not. Okay, take a picture. It's no. taking a video. Are you serious? It's taking a video. Are you freaking serious? Yeah. <laughs> it on. But they didn't care. So Google Glass, maybe it's died. It's okay. Don't worry, they're coming for the rest of you. It's fine. They're getting your wrist in a few weeks. They're getting the rest of you. It's fine. You can't, you know, people say, do you regret it? I don't regret it because the reality is it's the price you pay for being an early adopter. It's the price you pay for the ideas that you cannot teach the technology of the modern or the next day with the tools from the last century. And we have to remember that in school. I love the idea of augmented reality, not the gimmicky aspect of it where it's like, oh, the crayons came to life. That's cool, fine. Um, I like the idea where this is an, an object it's called the meta glasses that allow you to literally hold your hands out and make an object with your fingers and then get the file and print it out in 3D printer. That's pretty awesome. I love the fact that the Smithsonian Museum is now having augmented exhibits where you can look at your phone and it'll show you why the neck of the dinosaur or the bird or whatever looks that way. It's going to give us more immersive experiences. Now I know not every school is getting one of these and I don't think that they need to. But I love the idea that this is the immersive experience as opposed to, you know, writing a paper or looking online at, at an encyclopedia article. Maker spaces. Here's a school in California. Is this anyone's school here? This is the Black Pine Circle School? No? Okay. Well, showing off your school, guys, whatever. Could have been your, anyone's school, fine. I love this for so many reasons. Um, Gary Steger would like to know that that's him and Sylvia Martinez, that's their Invent to Learn book, which is awesome. By the way, if you haven't gotten into the maker movement yet, get that book. It's like the Bible of getting started in the maker movement. Um, I don't make any money from them, and I'll probably get crap on this for mentioning it. Gary likes to get it. Anyway, so, uh, um, but I love the idea. I love making. I love the idea that you can give power to these children to do things. You know, it's like what you used to do in school. I went to, I'm going off on a tangent now, and I know that's bad because we have 150 slides to go, but it's fine. I'm going to tell you a quick story. So here's the deal. I went to, when I went to go run for the school board, I met with one of the kindergarten teachers, and I said, oh, you know, my son was in kindergarten last year. Who'd you have? I had the woman down the hall. And she said, well, what was the one thing that you didn't like about kindergarten? I said, well, if I have to limit it to one thing, I'll tell you it's the fact that my son never, ever, ever came home dirty, ever. There was never anything under his fingernails, no marker, no paint, no clay, nothing. Because this classroom was about bubbling in. It wasn't about popping bubbles, you know? And that's what my thoughts were. Anyway, so 3D printing is getting even more exciting, I think. This is, you know, you can print out Legos, which to be honest with you, as a parent who buys ridiculous amounts of Legos, it's awesome. This is even more awesome. 
And this is not uncommon. Everyone's heard the stories, right, about kids that are being uh, given prosthetic arms, uh, veterans that are getting prosthetic arms, as clubs working in school. And many of you probably saw Robert Downey Jr. last week. Everyone see this video? How many people have not seen this? Raise your hand. All right, not enough of you to watch the whole thing. So Robert Downey Jr. goes as Iron Man and gives this kid who is missing one of his arms an Iron Man-like arm that was printed for him through this collective project. But the video that really didn't get as much press was the video of all these people coming together on a weekend project to design them, thousands of them, and then delivering them to people that needed them. This is the same type of uh, area. People this of week all we're celebrating ways. Engineers Week. You, I don't have enough time for you folks, but it was amazing. <laughs> This is a printer, this is the Voxel 8. This was just shown off at CES. This is a 3D printer that actually lets the printer paw, or it actually lays in the wiring. It pauses, you put the circuits in there and you could build anything. The video that they show is them building a quadrocopter. It costs $25 and it flies off the bed of the machine. It's pretty amazing. This is the world we live in. This is actually out in the hallway before. Hopefully some of you saw this. There's a school that is making their own 3D printer. Not making it from like parts that how to, making it in a CAD program and building it together. And it's actually one of the coolest looking ones I've seen in a long time. The idea was to make it a briefcase. Which high school? Justin High School. Justin High School, thank you. Awesome, yeah. Seriously, I want one, like well, we should talk. Uh, <laughs> But we're getting better artificial help, which I think is the other big trend in the future. We've all had these digital assistants in our pockets. They don't understand half the things I say because I talk a little fast, but that's okay. So whether you're talking to Siri or Cortana or, or Google or Alexa, and you know, it's whoever is helping you. And, and here's my son talking to Alexa. Alexa is this Amazon Echo on the right. Uh, we call her Alexa, and, and it's a her because it seems like a person. You say Alexa and you ask a question and it tells you some information. My kids learn that very, very quickly and very easily. So the cool thing is, is that it records, cool slash creepy, is it records everything that is said after the word Alexa. So this is what I hear back on my phone when I listen to what's been said. Wikipedia, South China Sea. Wikipedia, Cairo. Wikipedia, the world's tallest living man. Alexa, Wikipedia, Tyro, we are. <laughs> so, hey, totally legit, and she tells him exactly what he needs to know. It's, we're moving towards singularity. If, if Watson could beat Ken Jennings, I love this. It's not scary. People are like, oh, it's like Terminator. No, it's really amazing because it means you could outsource all of the crappy questions that you get all day and focus on doing something that is even better. It helps, yeah, it helps the teacher, you know, that role of teacher, it, it helps the teacher really become facilitator. And I don't mean facilitator is like on the side, let the kids do whatever the hell they want. I mean, you guide them with the learning, but it's guided by interest and passion. That sense of wonder is so desperately lacking in so many schools. We have to infect all the other people. And I used to say like be infectious, but then like Ebola came around and people were like, no, you know, no, not so much. We need to be infectious. You need to share what you're doing. The amazing work you do, you have to share. And when these kids ask questions, it's easy to be like, I don't know. These are my kids, this is the other day, they said to me, Daddy, I'm like, oh, here it is. Daddy, how many Hershey kisses would it take to reach the moon? And I'm like, a lot? <laughs> I don't know, like, more than a few. <laughs> so if you ever wanted to know the math, we measured it out, a Hershey kiss is roughly an inch, and it would take roughly that many Hershey kisses to get to the moon. <laughs> but this is like Saturday morning in my house. I'm sure many of you have kids that are just like as crazy and, and fun as that. My questions as a teacher used to be like this. They used to elicit this response. Everyone write a paper about the Globe Theater. Good? How long does it have to be? That was a crappy assignment. Today, you can give an assignment that says, read you know, a description about the Globe Theater, research the Globe Theater, and then make one in Minecraft and share it on YouTube. Because guarantee you they're gonna know a hell of a lot more about the Globe Theater with this than with the thing that they copied out of Wikipedia. Oh, everyone knows Kane's Arcade. Yeah, awesome. Sylvia's, oh, yes. By the way, the books, that, that were just published, that Sylvia made a second volume of Arduino projects, amazing. Doing them with my own kids, amazing. Anyone could download an app. I like that one in the middle, hey. Um, but, but the important thing is, why not upload an app? Challenge your kids to make an app. Everyone loves playing games, everyone loves doing things. Make an app. This is a school that made an app about cyberbullying. They uploaded it to the app store. You know, the graphics are exciting, but they did everything. 
And it really was an amazing project that incorporated every single aspect of everything you would do in school, whether it be writing and editing, whether it be the math to do the graphics and to do the programming, whether it be the social studies and, and uh, social studies, you know, if you're looking at historical, I mean, this was an all-encompassing project and it was awesome. And then they shared it with the world, which is something that I still, I know everyone's like, of course, we could share since like 20 years ago. It's amazing. It's still amazing. It's the difference of teaching our kids that they can just eat versus how to cook. We need to be teaching them how to cook, how to create, not just consume. Because we can all create stuff. We can create really cool stuff. I did this uh, this summer at ISTE with Michelle Bob when we found this um, hummingbird that they were having a party, they're letting people make. I'd never touched this thing in my life. We did hip hop hooray. Oh, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I, I got one at home and my kids are like, we can make R2D2. I'm like, well, you could make R2D2. I don't know how to make an R2D2 with that thing. And I don't have materials. So we went to Michael's. We spent like 20 bucks. We got all this stuff and we started building an R2. And my son programmed a very simple program where he would turn his head. And this is a... I love the smile because it's like such a, yeah, right? I mean, it's just like, oh my God, I did that. It was awesome. But it's not about the space. You don't have to have a school with thousands of dollars worth of equipment. It's about invaluing the maker, giving them the idea that you can do something small, amazing. The Kano computer is an amazing project that was on Kickstarter earlier last year. Uh, I got one. It's an amazing way to put together a computer. A three-year-old at the time, I know four, I read, you're four. A three-year-old at the time and a six-year-old built a computer and then understood what each part did. This is the brain and they explain everything. This is where the network connection comes in. And this is a kid, Angelo, who's 15 from the Philippines, whose village is so poor, he had to design a project that would help people in his village. And this is what he designed. It was a shoe that with the, uh, the motion energy, the kinetic energy in it while he walked, charged the USB device that charged cell phones for people in the village that had, couldn't afford electricity. Yeah, 15. It's amazing when kids are so much smarter than us, right? Like, the vendor floor is amazing. I can say this because the conference is over and hopefully the vendors are all packed up and gone. Um, <laughs> The vendor hall is amazing, but the vendor hall is not educational technology. The vendor hall is Home Depot. You are what make the things with the stuff. And I think that that's really important. This was at ISTE this past year. This is the saddest thing I've ever seen. I don't know if anyone saw that. I just find that to be very disrespectful. Just throwing it out there. Anyway, we are finally starting to shift the focus away from the device. You know, oh, this is a book of, you know, like whatever. It's not about this anymore, it's not about the stuff, it's about what we can do with our kids and the stuff. What do we empower them to do, create? Our tools are very malleable today. They're very malleable, and you as the craftspeople, the chefs, the artisans are gonna make the things that matter the most. As you lead the way and teach the people in your districts to know that technology is not about pouring icing on top of a cake, it's about kneading it into the dough and woving it into the fabric of what you do in your classes. And it's not always smooth sailing, folks. <laughs> right, I'm the first to admit there are some pain points in education. Oh, sorry. There are some pain points in education. Some of them happen in rooms that look just like this. Um, you know, maybe you've seen the poster, When I Die, I hope it's during a staff meeting because then the transition to death would be oh so subtle. Yeah, right? This was Chicago Public Schools last February. This is a training they had. Listen to how respectfully they were treated. And we are also going to use apposition. What else are we going to use? Apposition. So repeat after me. We will, we will use, use. Yes. Professional development should treat you like a professional. There's a thought, just saying. So, and I'm at, a, you know, it's funny because I'm here where at every, at every keynote we've been to and every session I've been to, there's been mention of Q Rockstar camps. There's been mention of, of Q meetings all across the entire state. That is amazing. That is incredible. And for me, coming from a state where it's like a once a year conference with maybe some ancillary things thrown in, that you have such a powerful network here to do amazing work. We know that PD is not the magician coming in, spinning some plates and then leaving. The thing that they never leave behind, they leave all the wires and the manuals, the thing they don't leave behind, the gadgets are there, but there's one thing that's missing. And the thing that misses from all of this professional development, the desperate ingredient that we all need, all of us, is what? It's time. It's time. You can't keep on loading things in the car because you'll never be able to fit the driver in there. And we all need to know that trying things is amazing, but we have to give ourselves the ability to try one thing at a time, evaluate and move on. You can't try 50 things and then say, well, it's all broken, I'm done. <laughs> one of them broke, but you don't know which one. A lot of people feel like they're drowning. And again, you know, I preach to the choir here where all of you are like, I love drinking from the hose. 
And with that, I, I right? That sounds vaguely dirty. Anyway, so uh, sorry. It's been a long. It's been a long conference. Teachers, yeah, sorry. Sometimes I get a little loopy. Uh, teachers find time to make these things happen. You're here on a Saturday, by the way. I don't know if you remember, like Saturday, <laughs> one of the days off. <laughs> um, but you're here. And the, what I love about educators, what I really do passionately love, is that everyone's a sponge. And we all use the same resources. And we're all online. We're soaking everything up all the time. We want to learn more and more and more. And then we want to share it with folks. It is better to drink from the fire hose. As someone who is, you know, I'm sure many of you, how many people are new teachers, brand new teachers, like last year or two? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You might not remember what it was like when there was a faculty room where you were the only person that thought the way you were and you thought everything sucked. But I do. And I would imagine some of you felt the same way. My idea to kind of incorporate tools to make something of value was seen as a little nuts. It is better to drink from the fire hose than wander an endless desert, whether it be Palm Springs or another desert, looking for a drop of water. Schools are not prisons. The goal of a school is not to move a kid from second grade to third grade so he'll pass the exam. This is not what school is about. And we all know that. It's sometimes hard to convince kids that that's not what it's about. Our classrooms are gateways to true possibility. They are places where amazing things can happen. As Californians, you probably know A113, right? Some of you do, some of you don't. Yeah, you've probably seen this a million times and didn't even know it. A113 is used in Toy Story. You'll find it in Bugs Life. You'll find it in Monsters, Inc., in The Simpsons, in The Avengers. It's everywhere. And what it stands for is a classroom an actual classroom in Cal Arts, where so many of the directors, John Lasseter, all these amazing folks, went to school. It is an homage to the place that they fine-tuned and honed their craft and worked with their people that they, that they came of age with and, found and fell in love with the thing that they do. How can we make our classrooms like A113? I think I would drop dead if one of my kids was like, you know, Mr. B? I, I, dedicate, I, I hid this little secret number. I don't even remember the room I taught in. Like, oh, room number seven. Room number seven. They don't remember, I guarantee you. We have to make our classes like that. And you do it by taking away the rules that we traditionally have and following a model where the role is to be ready, to dream big, to take risks. Our, cl our classrooms and our schools have to be places of infectious passion. And some, a lot of people, and again, not you, because you're here, but a lot of people think, I can't do it. And what I like to tell those people, what you can tell those people, is you can't do it yet. Because there was a day when we couldn't do it. My babysitter tells my kids, can't is the man that never tries. And my kids repeat it to me all the time. So switching gears a little bit, I know I have a little bit left, I promise I'm wrapping up soon. The evolution of social. We're in an age where social media is so vitally important. I'd like to remind you of this. For schools that don't let their kids use social media, this is what I would like to tell you. That is not a viable solution to keeping children safe. And social media, might I remind you, for any of you that use tools that build four digital walls around your kids and say that they're being social, let me remind you what social is about. Social is about taking down the walls of this digital classroom and allowing all of our students to learn with and from other people, teachers and students alike. Because we know that that's where the value is. If I was only able to talk to the five people that worked in my school district on Twitter, I don't think it would be the same place that it is now, and if people say, well, if, you know, if they have social, they might be cheating. In the real world, cheating is actually called collaboration. That's what we do, we, we collaborate, right? And digital footprints, I, you know, people used to fight all the time with digital footprints. Well, we need to make sure they have a, a no digital footprint or a clean digital footprint. These kids come to you with digital footprints the minute that they are conceived. Facebook page, Twitter account, you know, like, they have a digital footprint already. I want my kids to use them. And social media can be used for things like this. And that, that's the ice bucket thing, yeah, so. And things like this, and that. Yeah, woo! It's amazing, and that was, you know, I, I always tell the story about chat because uh, Tom Whitby would probably kill me if I didn't, but, so it's Whitby and Steven Anderson and, and Shelly Terrell, three educators that were located at different points in the country and the globe at the time, came together and started talking online on Twitter. And from that spawned a billion and a half chats. And that's incredible, because it started with educators that wanted to do something that was powerful and important. The other one that I love to point out all the time is EdCamp. How many people have been to an EdCamp? Awesome. I will tell you, for those that did not raise your hands, you should go. There's plenty of them. You can go to the website and find out where there is one. There's one in April, what? 
San Jose, there you go. There you go. Okay, okay. There were 310 last year. There will be more this year. And there was actually one at the Department of Education. And this guy showed up for a minute. Not a video. He actually came. It was amazing. For about 30 seconds, he said this. This is pretty neat. That is a verbatim quote. Teacherpreneurism. Teacherpreneurs. I created some tools. That's exciting. Not really. What's exciting is the fact that we are in California where everyone and their mother is working on a startup. It's like, oh, what do you do? I drive a bus, but I also have a startup. Good. Um, this is amazing because the idea that you can build something of value for the kids that you have, for the people you have, it's not about, it's not something impressive. It's, and people say, oh, you know, that's really amazing. No, it's not. It's something not in the water, but in the DNA of an educator to create solutions, be it digital or otherwise, that benefit their peers and their classmates and their classroom. That's what we all do. And that's amazing. Rockstar teacher, Karippo. Yeah. So, the, you know, I was gonna try to like show how many dates there are. There's like a billion things going on. There are half of them are sold out, so I can't even you know, advertise that. But you get it, John? I'll wait for John to get this picture. Yeah, excellent. So, an idea for five years ago, John? Five years. Let's do PD a little bit. We'll do these rockstar camps. And I, I remember actually talking to John about this at like ISTE in, in Denver or Philly or somewhere. And I was like, that's really cool. And followed through and everything is amazing. Everything is awesome. Yeah, so awesome. Alice Keeler who's not here. Coffee EDU, which by the way, might I say, I, I will say one thing. I love Alice, but I will say one thing. I showed up at 6.30 this morning for Coffee EDU. It was like me and Kathy Schrock. We were walking around. We're like, guess we'll get coffee. What's up, Mike? We like kind of crouched on it. Anyway, so... Coffee EDU, amazing. Invented thinking machine. Rams is not here because he's having babies soon, which is amazing. But Chris, you're here, right? Somewhere? Oh, anyway. So I love the fact you guys are doing and sharing so many amazing things that are inspiring for everyone else. This is a state filled with innovation from the top to the bottom, and my goodness, it is a large state. You guys are doing incredible things. Did I not? You want me to go back? I'll go back. So he's like, I hear groaning. I didn't get the picture. It's coming. So there you go. All right. Should I leave the stage? I don't know. If you want me to leave, I'll leave. All right. You got it? Good. All right. Good. We connect with people that we're just really, I, I have to thank you more than just say uh, how amazing you guys are doing. I have learned and have been able to share so much more from what you share online, from what you put on Instagram, from talking the other day at the Unconference. I was asking questions about from David Malone and Jen Roberts about like, oh, uh, you know, if, if we we're going to do a one-to-one -one initiative in the district that I'm talking to, like, what would, you guys are so helpful and I appreciate it so much. That's where you go for help. For those of you that are not on Twitter that you think, oh, it's yeah, yeah, fine. This is where I go for help. And it may sound like a broken record. I'm not here to tell you to go online and do it. But as an educator, you are missing out if you are not getting engaged with people uh, that, that, are, that are sharing so much content with you. It is the faculty room that I always dreamed of having, right? So, and, it, and it's a great place for friends. I mean, I think honestly, like it's so nice for me to be here where I can connect with so many awesome educators that I'm so friendly with from whether it be online or having met at the GTA or whatever. Anyway, so thank you guys for doing what you do. Continue to grow and learn at PLN. Those of you that are here, how many people are starting at the Gave Summit tomorrow? Yeah, awesome. So you have another opportunity to keep doing this and to do more. There's safety and there's power in numbers. Alone we are smart, together we are brilliant. That's a quote from uh, Stephen Anderson. It is so true. It is so true. Find the band of crazy people to walk with you and you'll see that the challenges you face in your district that are real challenges. I do not say up here that it's impossible, that it's, uh, you know, you can go in tomorrow and do everything that we talked about and dreamed about, but you could start. And those challenges with the help of others can be seen as only opportunities as things that we can do. Oh, wow, thank you, I'll pay you later. So, um, but don't let Twitter become this. We have to challenge each other because we can't just sit here and be like, oh, you did great, you did great. I love you, Adam, don't scream out, I hate you, Adam. That'll make me feel really bad. But anyway, so, but the idea is this, we can't only talk to ourselves. We have to make sure that we're getting all sides of the equation and the argument. The one thing that I hate is hearing just. I've introduced myself to a couple of people and they're like, oh, I'm just a kindergarten teacher. No, you just teach kindergartners? Like you just manage a classroom full of, you know, five-year-olds and get them to love to do things like learning about science and reading? That's pretty more amazing than just. So don't ever say, I'm just a blank. Don't relegate yourself to a, to a, a place of mediocrity. You do an amazing job. And with that said, you know, we have to remember it is not, it is easy as adults in a room full of adults to get excited about the adult problems. It's not about adults though, it's about these kids that we have the pleasure of teaching and working with. Empower these kids, let them touch the technology, let them share the technology, let them teach. 
It's pretty amazing. And as I said before, they're doing amazing things already. They don't need help. They need us to in, in really embrace and, and just kind of hold up their examples. Technology helps us to, to uh, enhance our capacity to share and to learn and connect and create. But more than technology, we have to change our culture. We have to stop waiting for people to tell us it's okay or tell us that here's the, the way we're going to do it. You're here. You have experienced a conference that I have been to seven sessions at this conference and not a single one of them did I sit there and say, oh, I picked a bad one. I have learned from every single person that was sharing. And that's a lot of things that I can take back and share with other people. You were here. And the time to start doing what you've learned and found as, as a way to do it is now. Because our actions will speak louder than buzzwords. So to tweet out that, oh, this is a great idea, to implement that idea and then share out the results is more important. So please do that. It is not about technology. In the end, it is about the one thing that makes a difference. It is about you as educators. It's about us, a community of ed tech leaders that want to go forth and shine examples of the light of our kids. And, and know that, I will tell you this, it, it, you know, we hold the brush that paints the future. And you're only going to be confined by the walls that we build ourselves. So looking to that future, I, I chose the year 2029 because that's the year that my youngest son will graduate high school. It's a generational future. If you have a kid that's going to preschool next year, that's when they will age out. So this is the class of 2029. Yep. Give them the student voice. They have it, amplify it. Studentpreneurism, the same way I talked about teacherpreneurism, I think the biggest trend will be studentpreneurism. I saw students before making, they were working on uh, an Android app. They couldn't get it to work, but at the time, it was an incredible idea. They were going to actually, every time you had, I took a picture, it was going to point where you were, kind of like geolocation, and they were doing it for the, uh, you know, where you park your bike and where you uh, do all sorts of stuff. It, it was really very, very cool. And the fact that these are kids in high school and middle school that are making these things, the sky's the limit. We are more connected now, and we will be more connected than ever before, which is an incredible thing. But I think we also have to remember that we sometimes have to disconnect. When we were at an event the other day, we're sitting outside. Now, I might have to tell you, you might have to come to New York with me to, exam to feel what 20 degrees feels like. Everyone was sitting outside looking down. I looked up. There's a mountain out there. It's pretty awesome. Some palm trees. It's hot. It's nice. There are some things you cannot get on an app store. For real. And one of those things is curiosity. It can help you, but it can diminish it as well. So when you have super kids like I do, you have to know, come on slides, there you go, that there are two gifts that we should always aim to give our children, our students. One of them is roots. We give them roots and we ground them in what's going on. And at the same point, we want to give them wings. We want to give them the ability to stay grounded as a, as a person, but contribute and know that whatever they dream of being, they can do. So we stand at a crossroads right now, and my advice for the lifelong learner, I promise it's the end soon, is that we have to create and share. Share everything you do. Even if you think it sucks, it's going to help someone get better at something else, and especially it'll help you because you'll get feedback from other people as well. Live a life in beta where you promise that you're going to be as good as you can be today, but you'll be better tomorrow. Take away all of these, these self-put-in bars of limitation. Take it away. Because the sky is the limit for you. And know that you'll make mistakes. Because if you do, if you do, it means that you were trying something new. That it was possible to do something better. Individualize and don't standardize. When it comes to yourself, when it comes to your kids. And don't allow this technology that we have, which is incredibly amazing, to eclipse humanity. Don't say that I am just a blank, because you're so much more, and if you don't believe it, it's not true. So we've talked about the past and the present and the future, and here's the real beauty of that. The vehicle that drives us from the past to the future is called the present, and it's our car. And since we're driving the car, what I want to ask you is think about where do you want to go? Thank you guys very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.